Okay, as it's my um, chief job to keep everyone to time, can um, we begin? Um, it's my great pleasure, thank you to the IEA, IEA for inviting me to chair this panel and it's my pleasure to welcome um, these guests. Um, I won't waste any more time because we want to hear from them. So I'll just introduce them briefly. Um, from my right is um, King Asuli, he's from Head of Higher Education Sector in um, DG of the European Commission. We have Professor Andrew Deeks, who's the president of UCD. This is not Danny McCoy. I introduce Claire McGee, who is Innovation and Education Policy on behalf of IBEC, and um, Jim Miley, who's the Director General of the IUA. So we start with Kinga. There will be time at the end for questions. So this is a, my first slide is just a, a recapitulative of what, uh, what the EU is doing uh, on on education, on higher education. It's a national competence, education. Uh, so uh, as it said in the treaties, uh, the EU's role is to support states uh, in their higher education policy. Uh, there are three main things we are doing uh, in this support role. Uh, we are building uh, evidence-based uh, uh, agendas, prepare, uh, recommendations uh, for for the member states uh, collecting data uh, to to have uh, uh, the relevant knowledge to build these policies on. Uh, we also uh, organize uh, policy cooperation and support peer learning activities among member states and uh, stakeholder organizations. Uh, also to help uh, um, member states to learn from each other when they are building their education policy. And of course we have uh, some financial means, uh, program funding for uh, individuals and also for organizations. The Erasmus Plus program, uh, I'm sure it's uh, well known everywhere. Uh, the Horizon 2020 program for supporting research and also the European Structural and Investment Funds. That's a very important source of development for higher education, especially uh, in the uh, Eastern Member States. So uh, if we speak about uh, policy setting or agenda setting for policy making, uh, this is just a snapshot of our new initiative, uh, the building of the European education area. Uh, with the main key uh, points, what we are suggesting. Uh, mutual recognition of diplomas, uh, the creation of European universities, and uh, uh, the creation of an EU student card. All these initiatives uh, target uh, greater mobility. And uh, this is just what we recently finalized, uh, uh, a council recommendation on mutual recognition of diplomas. So the uh, negotiations will now start in the European Council about that. Uh, we have the renewed agenda for higher education with uh, our four key uh, initiatives uh, on excellence and skill development, inclusive and connected systems, higher education innovation, and uh, effective and efficient higher education system. Um, for example, uh, we are now um, in the process of managing a pilot European graduate survey. Uh, right now, only in eight member states in the EU, but the plan is to extend it and have a European-wise graduate survey uh, where it's clear uh, what are the uh, added value of higher education in the different member states. We have the Bologna process, and uh, uh, with this I would like to uh, turn to uh, the data collection and uh, the comparative statistics we are providing uh, to, to help um, uh, member states uh, setting their agenda. Uh, there was the, the ministerial conference in May, uh, less than a month ago, in Paris, uh, where uh, we published uh, uh, the implementation report on the Bologna Key Commitments. 
This is the, the first uh, chart I selected. This is a comparative uh, uh, statistics of uh, funding of higher education uh, in, in the 48 uh, Bologna countries. Um, it's quite small, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, Ireland is, is on the lower part of the scale. Uh, so it's uh, circled in red. I don't know if it's visible. Uh, so it's, it's clear that uh, uh, most of the, of the Bologna member countries spend more on higher education uh, than Ireland. Um, as I heard also uh, from the previous speakers, funding uh, is a real challenge for the, for the Irish education. Uh, higher education system, uh, the, the European University Association uh, in their funding observatory calls it an aggravating decline, uh, the Irish uh, higher education funding. Uh, and um, it's also quite visible that while there was recently some increase uh, in funding for teaching or staff, and, uh, and the, the, the level of funding for uh, infrastructure is not uh, declining. Uh, there is a decrease uh, of uh, funding for research. And it's sh also shown here that uh, it's, uh, the upper part of the graph is the annual expenditure on research, uh, on, on non-research related funding for higher education, and the lower part is the R&D related funding. If we turn to the student perspective, uh, I show you uh, data from another very recent uh, uh, publication, which is the um, Eurostudent survey. Uh, it's done in all Erasmus member countries, so in 33 countries. Uh, I selected this uh, graph because it's quite interesting to see that uh, in terms of student expenditures, uh, Ireland is, uh, has the lowest amount what students need to spend on uh, housing, uh, food, and communication, so the, the basic needs. Uh, while if we go for uh, student expenses related to education, uh, it's the other end. Ireland is on the other end. So with 35% of uh, the, the student total uh, expenditure, uh, it's, the, it's the most. But if we add up the two, uh, it's, uh, it's about 70% um, what student uh, in Ireland uh, spend, or 80% what student in Ireland spend on, uh, on, on living and fees. So uh, the, the free um, income of students, what they can spend on, on other non-necessarily expenditure is around 20%. With that, uh, Ireland is relatively expensive for students. Uh, it's uh, comparable to France uh, or um, some other expensive countries, uh, while uh, in Netherlands, for example, or in Finland, uh, the, the free uh, income of students, what they can spend is, is around 30-32%. Again, um, a comparative uh, uh, study, which is on working students. On average, 51% of students are working uh, during studies. Uh, and uh, there is no big difference between uh, uh, the different member states. So uh, there are countries where it's about 10% uh, higher or lower. Ireland is around the average. But if you look at uh, uh, the amount of time students spend on by working, uh, Ireland with 25 hours uh, average is, is on, on the lower end. While in the Eastern European states, work is much more important for students. And it's, it's, uh, it's very relevant for the, for the general perspective of, uh, of students themselves because those who are primarily working, they don't consider themselves students. They consider themselves 
as employees and they just uh, work, uh, they just study as, uh, as a secondary uh, activity. So uh, the next slide is just so that we prepare figures uh, for uh, education institutions. And uh, these are the uh, working groups we are organizing. So I also wanted to show you the Education Monitor 2017 figures uh, uh, very quickly that uh, the tertiary education attainment uh, is amazingly high. In, uh, in Ireland, much higher than the EU average, which is 39%, while here is 52%. Uh, the only figure where Ireland is below the EU average is adult participation in learning. Uh, this I skipped because of time. And uh, finally, I wanted to show you the, the financial means the EU uh, offer. Uh, it's a brand new um, paper that uh, came out, the new financial perspectives uh, the, uh, the commission is preparing. Uh, we propose to double the budget uh, for the Erasmus Plus program and triple the number of uh, students who can participate in mobility uh, for the next uh, uh, period from 2021 to 2027. Uh, we also propose a high increase for the research funds. It will be called uh, Horizon Europe, not Horizon 2020, uh, about 100 billion euros for the next perspective. And uh, we would like also to boost uh, the Invest EU uh, funding through the um, European Investment Bank which offer uh, loans, guarantees, uh, and other innovative financial means uh, also for higher education. Around 4 billion euros that are set for, for social investment in that, under that uh, framework. So this is just uh, <coughs> what I wanted to quickly show you. And uh, if there are any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer. And we'll thank Kinga now, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Kinga. Okay, so thank, thank you very much and it's a, a pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk a little bit about how we might move towards a, a sustainable funding model for higher education in Ireland. I think there are a number of points that, that are generally agreed. I don't know if this is working. It is? Okay. And the, the first of those would be that the reason that we need to relook at the funding of higher education is because of the massification of higher education over the last 50 years. And Peter made a reference to that in his talk. So within 50 years, participation has moved from approximately 5% of the population to, as we've seen from the slide here, more than 50%. And that's a huge increase and dramatically affects the economies of how universities and higher education in general can be funded. So we've seen over a period of time then a need for countries to reassess how they fund higher education. That need hasn't been so critical in the US because traditionally much more of that education was privately funded and so consequently the system was much more scalable. Now, I think the other thing that's generally agreed is that higher education brings both a public benefit and a private benefit. And there are numerous studies that attempt to quantify that. One can take issue with individual studies, but all of that research points to there being a significant public benefit and a significant private benefit. Then, in terms of the Irish system, the report that Peter's group did was an extraordinary piece of work. And I say that as being a skeptic when Rory originally set up that group. Uh, I was questioning where the expert bit fitted in to, to the members of that group, with no, no insult intended to those members, because the report that was done was an extraordinary piece of work. It genuinely looked around the world at how this problem was being addressed. It looked at the Irish system and came out with 
a very reasonable quantification of what additional funding was needed. And I have not heard one person take issue with the figures which are in, within that report or with the range of options that are presented in the report. So congratulations, Peter. It was an extraordinary piece of work. But the question is then how we can advance from there. And I thought in terms of my own talk, since Peter has basically covered all of that, it would be useful to reflect. Uh, I, I'm probably the only person in this room and perhaps in Ireland that has been through this debate now three times. So once in Australia over 30 years ago, uh, where the, the income contingent loan scheme was born, then about six or seven years ago in the UK, and now we've been uh, participating in this debate for the last almost five years. So I thought it would be worthwhile from that point of view to re reflect on, on what I'd seen there. Now, the Australian experience was one where the higher education system had been free, totally free, with the exception that you had to pay your student union dues before they would let you enrol. And I vividly remember that the cost of those fees was $270, which in those days was a lot of money for a student. If you were a conscientious objector and you didn't want to fund the student union, you had to give the $270 to charity before they would let you enrol in the university. But there was no fees associated with your enrolment. So that, that system, as the massification came and the number of people participating in higher education in Australia increased, became uh, un unfundable by the, the Australian government and they had to move to, to a new system. And the system that they came up with was a system that was called a higher education contribution scheme. Now, as you'd be aware, the Australians are very keen on fair play. You know, in Australia, everything has to be fair. So having decided that there was a public benefit and a private benefit to higher education, then a report was done in Australia which split the courses into a number of broad bands, so engineering, law, science, education, arts and humanities, etc. And then a piece of work was done to work out what was the public benefit, or what was the private benefit rather, for each of those courses and how much did the course cost to deliver? And then for each of those banded subjects, a decision was made in terms of how much of the cost of delivery should be borne by the state and how much should be borne by the individual. So for example, law is a relatively cheap course to deliver, but the returns to the individuals, particularly in Australia, were very high. So to get a law degree in Australia, you would then pay a significant component as a private contribution. Whereas for engineering, it was a high cost subject. The returns were somewhat more modest than the lawyers, and I say this as an engineer. And so there was a, a, a more uh, balanced sharing of the cost of the course between the individual and the state. So with that piece of work done, the system was rolled out with what is now been called an income contingent loan scheme. And the advantage of that was that Australia went from this situation of it was totally free to go to university to it was still free at point of entry. So no one was disadvantaged through that scheme. And there, there was some initial resistance, but what I found at the time as an academic was it really focused the minds of the students when they came in in first year. So they had made a decision that they really wanted to be at university. They realized they'd have a debt to pay at the end of it, and they focused much more on their studies than they did before that. Now, I'm sure that's not the case in Ireland, but it's worth saying that that was the case in, in Australia. Now, in the Australian system, the financial aid to the students is not part of that income contingent loan scheme. It's fully means tested. If you qualify fi for financial aid, then you are given financial aid and there is no expectation of that being paid back. So it means that everyone that graduates from law in Australia graduates with the same student debt, as it, it's now called, to pay back, the same contribution to pay back. And we know that they'll all get jobs which will have basically the same uh, private benefits. So that's a fair scheme. Now, fast forward to, to my experience in the UK, 
When the UK government considered a change to, to the system there, which the Conservatives thought, well, the Australian system's all very well, but wouldn't it be even better if the students paid for everything? Uh, and of course, that's not a, a suggestion that's made in Peter's report. But that was exactly how the debate panned out in, in the UK. And it wasn't a debate because the UK government, you know, shock horror, did not consult with anyone within the sector in terms of what their proposals would be. Uh, to the extent that they told us that we were to set our fees between 6,000 and 9,000 pounds a year, and we were to not, not to consult with each other in setting those fees, and then they financed their loan system on the basis the average fee would be 7,500 pounds, because obviously if you set the bottom at six and the top at nine, that would be the, the average fee. Now, when each university individually decided what their fee would be, as you would recall, of 136 universities in the UK, 134 came with an answer of 9,000 pounds, and two mugs came with an answer of 7,500 pounds. I won't name those universities, they quickly changed their, their view the, the next year. So it, it shows you what happens if you don't consult with the, the sector. So, and uh, the, the other part of the UK system which uh, I found entirely unfair was that then they lumped the student financial aid onto the loan system. So now students from disadvantaged backgrounds graduated from the same programs as their uh, classmates, but with higher loans to pay back. So there, there were a whole range of things that were wrong in the UK system that in an Irish system we could get right. So uh, I, I think that the, those are some observations, but the common thing about both systems was that a courageous political decision was made to make a change. So the problem was recognized, a courageous decision was made to make a change, and then those changes were worked through relatively quickly. After a couple of years in Australia, it kind of drifted in the background and became the norm. We've seen for a range of reasons in the UK, basically because the, it was a very poorly constructed system to start with, that that hasn't quite happened. But the, the main message that I'd have is it takes political courage. It takes someone with vision and the willingness to make it happen. Um, thank you, Laura. And I suppose I just want to add I, uh, to the comments uh, to Peter and your, your expert group with the report, because from an IBEC perspective, we would agree that it's perhaps the most authoritative and balanced um, document that we can um, enable a discussion around the future funding of higher education. And I also just want to kind of commend the Institute and, and the Higher Education Authority for bringing that back onto the table now. And really the perspective I want to give with you today is since the publication of the report um, and in light of last week's uh, QS rankings, is talking about what has happened from that perspective from um, a, a business environment. And I'm going to talk around kind of the international reputation that the business environment in Ireland is, is working within. Uh, so a couple of things have, have really happened since 2016, since that report was published. We are under intense pressure around our competitiveness uh, and around that international reputation. Ireland, in that period of time, has failed to deliver on a couple of key infrastructural projects, be that uh, the development of data centres in the west of the country, the National Children's Hospital, and further, and higher education is, is just another one of those failures to invest. Uh, and as a result, it's having an impact on our, on, on our international competitiveness. And recent publications through the National Competitive Council and the refresh of Enterprise 2025 has highlighted this stark um, I suppose, lens in which we now need to look at and how Ireland is actually losing momentum in our ability to actually foster and develop a talent pipeline for business uh, to actively attract foreign direct investment and, and to stimulate uh, innovation within our indigenous sector. So the talent crisis is not just acute in Ireland, it's, it's a global crisis. Uh, and we are, uh, the, com the companies who are, who are based here in Ireland are, are, in are hiring internationally. So all eyes are on this. It's a shared global phenomenon. And how we respond to this will matter. 
uh, and the world is watching in terms of who's doing most to address this challenge. Uh, and, and mobile investment is chasing down where that, mo that investment is moving to. So we know that research and investment is, is incredibly mobile. And the, ab the, the ability to, to deliver talented people uh, and well-rounded people, for, for, so companies are moving to where they can get staff, not necessarily where those natural resources traditionally used to lie. So that's that international kind of competitive dynamic that I want, wanted to kind of highlight. Uh, companies, as I mentioned, are, are, are moving, the, they're relocating in that. So they're looking at competitiveness through a new lens. Uh, we know that our tax attractiveness, we're losing ground on that one. So therefore, the companies who are embedded into our economy here are now looking at ta uh, competitiveness through the talent, as I mentioned, uh, the ability. The, the potential to develop intellectual property uh, in Ireland and also through innovation. And interestingly enough, higher education is at the nexus of all three of those. So again, another uh, strong rationale uh, to fund that. So who really is getting their act together? Do we have a plan? I think we don't have a shortage of ambition in this country. We don't have a shortage of strategy. But what we lack is uh, a detailed and resource implementation to get us to our ambition. Um, be that to be the innovation leader, uh, and be that to have the best education over the next decade. So how do we develop that plan uh, with commitment, committed resources? And, and to Andrew's comments, that takes political will, it takes cross-party political will, and it takes a collaborative partnership approach from all of us uh, around that. The way in which, I suppose, the, the education sector must fundraise at present in terms of uh, targeting be it uh, the department uh, deeper or be it through the Department of Education and Skills, on an annual basis to get incremental uh, funding year on year does not enable strategic planning for the sector. It does not enable the sector to respond appropriately to the challenges of the future of work, uh, to the future of our society, and many of those grand challenges that we face both in Ireland and, and internationally. Uh, so we need to start moving towards this multi-annual nature of funding, similar to how we actually plan for other national strategic investments of, of critical importance. Um, so I was very glad to hear Peter reiterate the point that, that we do not want to see just a band-aid approach to fix uh, the current problem, that we actually need to push beyond that boundary and think about the future because, again, back to how can Ireland be prepared to adapt and to create those um, the, the global citizens and well-rounded and flexible learners for the future that both higher education, further education and, and industry can all work together. I just very quickly, and I suppose to, to enable a bit of Q&A afterwards, um, what we need to do, make sure as well is around business, the role of business in, in all of this. I think it goes without saying business currently contribute quite substantially to, to higher education, uh, be that through the National uh, Training Fund, and we saw the increase in that levy. So in 2017, uh, business um, through, through that fund is about 450 million. 2018, uh, it's going to look like 550 million. So there's a significant amount of, 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 of uh, cash going into that, not only through research and inno innovation projects, through employers being actually active within the classroom, through program review, through in-cash and in-kind contributions, uh, through phil phil uh, philanthropy, uh, and equally around work placement. And we know that there is a strategic goal there to increase the work placement. So taking students actually out of the classroom, bringing them in, in into the, the business environment, again, is where enterprise are very much committed to delivering on our national uh, ambitions. So maybe my closing points is um, international reputation matters. The rankings, while they're crude and they have limitations, they matter. They're a metric in which it's used, ne not necessarily by us, but against us. And we need to be able to respond appropriately uh, to that. So my, my last question is, do we have a plan and what is that plan going to be, and how can we resource and action upon that plan? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, like others, I'd like to uh, uh, commend Peter and his group for the excellent analysis. Usually when you start out trying to solve a problem, you're trying to... Um, look at the root causes and, and, and the analysis and looking at the solutions. Uh, and so one of the benefits we have in this scenario is there is a very 
clear analysis, as good as you could get on any problem in any sector, and some very clear and succinct um, options for solving it. Um, one of the challenges with the problem is, is I guess, um, is is the fact that this is a crisis, but 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 it's it's not immediately seen to be a crisis. I describe it as a rotting bridge. It's it's not a burning bridge, but it's a wooden bridge that has that has that has that is slowly rotting. And to Claire's point, you know, we get we get to a point somewhere along the way where the bridge begins to collapse, and the quality that we've spent, you know, over a hundred years, or in certain of our institutions, hundreds of years building up. Um, uh, a reputation in uh, higher level education uh, could quite quickly evaporate. And I think that's, that's the scale of the problem. Kinga referenced some European league tables, and I'd recommend you should Google, yeah, the European Universities Association have been tracking funding in the university systems across 34 uh, systems across Europe, uh, broader Europe. Uh, so if you Google EUA funding observatory, uh, you can download their latest report. And it interestingly groups countries into, into five categories. There are those with signs of recovery, and this is kind of tracking it over 10 years. There are those uh, who are making what they describe as cautious steps forward. There are those with a continuing commitment to investment, and no surprise that has Austria, Germany, and Luxembourg in there. And then there's a small group who are described as in aggravating decline. And that's the group we're in. Uh, and it's us, and it's Spain, and it's a very small number of countries in the Balkans. Um, you know, not, not the kind of place you want to be in any kind of league table. Then there's some other special cases in a fifth grouping. Um, so, you know, when we look at this crisis, we need to look at it in this context. You know, we, we, we are benchmarked, uh, whether we like it or not, international students, of whom there are 10,000 or... or 15% of our total student population now, sorry, way, way more than 10,000 uh, in our system. Um, they're looking at rankings, they're looking at our reputation in, in, in coming here, and businesses that Claire has spoken about are very much looking at our reputation uh, and our capacity in higher level education. So, we, so we've got this challenge, and, and we've, you know, we've, I would describe, there's a challenge of bridging the gap in funding that Peter has very clearly laid out. And then we have, I think there's a, there's a three-dimensional challenge to follow that. We have, we know, and this is a fact, we, we will have to teach more students in more flexible ways in the next decade and more. We have 40,000 coming into the system by 2030. On current trend, 25,000 of those will go to the, 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 the universities. But even if that balance changes, you know, that's the order of it. Um, we know that we need to increase the scale and scope of, of our investment in research and innovation, uh, and, 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 and that's a, a key part of what we need to do for the economy. And we know that we need to expand access uh, for students and increase our engagement with communities and with industry. Uh, I mean, they, they, are, they are the given facts. Um, so the funding challenge has to be set in that context. Um, I, th I think the, you know, the, the issues around funding has been well articulated, so I, I, I won't go over that again. I do want to come back to another dimension of the, of, of, of the challenge that, that Peter laid out before us, and that, that this is a, 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 the solution here rests in an integrated approach. And that does mean that we need uh, change within the system as well, and, and the system very well recognizes that. But we also need to have change in how the system is run. So Peter referenced the fact that at the moment 64, 65% of the money going into third level comes from the state. But actually there are individual institutions, some represented in this room, where only about a third of their money is currently coming from the state. But, and here's the big but, there's 100% state control on whole aspects of what they do. So, no university or institute of technology can hire or fire or pay people what they want. They are subject to the employment control framework. They have no flexibility and no capacity. So Peter's point about the need for flexibility and nimbleness in the system is an absolute given for the future. But in the current structure, that flexibility and nimbleness simply isn't there. So we need the... Uh, the structures and the overall framework within which third-level education is run. You know, this isn't, 
this isn't a linear system like, you know, uh, having three and a half thousand secondary schools, all of which do largely the same thing uh, and, 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 and have a, a fixed curriculum. Third level institutions are completely different. There is, there is, they're on the opposite end of the spectrum to that. And all of the international evidence tells us that the most flexible and nimble institutions are the ones that do best. And uh, I think the solution that we have to find here is not, I mean, I won't say not just, because primarily it is about getting more funding into the system. But alongside that, we need to have a, 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 a structure that the system operates in that allows us to perform to its best. And I think if, if, if we approach it in that way, then I think we have a, a meaningful uh, uh, chance of success. But that does require a change in thinking. Like, universities can't be regarded as just another part of the public service. Um, they are much more akin to, uh, you know, semi-state uh, type institutions. And certainly they, they can and should have public funding uh, into the future. We do not want to go the American system or to do the about turn that the UK did. Um, we, 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 we should have a blended system, but that does require a change, a change in thinking at government level in terms of how the system is run. The last point I want to make is, I suppose, about the political difficulty of this, and, and we're in a logjam, you know, we've, we have the solutions all on the table, but nobody's prepared to embrace them because there's, there is perceived to be a major political challenge uh, about taking on, you know, fees or loans or anything like that. So let's reflect on that for a moment. How big is that challenge? As a country, we've just done the most difficult thing politically that you could think of. We've repealed an amendment relating to abortion. And we've we did it with, uh, by and large, political consensus. Um, we went through a difficult but a very controlled process, and we reached a decision at the end of it. Now, if as a country and if as a political system, and this isn't just about government, it's about the entire political system and the decision makers within it. If we have a capacity to take on and deal with an issue such as abortion, then you know, surely we can sort out higher level education before breakfast. So I'll just ask you please to hold your questions for a moment. We're going to give the first response to, I suppose, the most important stakeholder, which is our students. So I welcome um, Michael Kerrigan, president of the UCI. The perspective of the Union of Students in Ireland in regards to future funding of higher education is not something that will surprise many people in this room. When it comes to the Castles report, USI and students are in favour of option one, a publicly funded system for higher education. Back in October, we held a demonstration with thousands of students marching from the Custom House to the Department of the Taoiseach. Um, I gave a speech there, but before I did, I, I, was, I was looking at what to say and, and what I would talk about. I said I'd have a look at the countries across Europe and across the world that offered fully publicly funded higher education. The countries you'd expect to see there were all there, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Austria and Germany. I've also seen Estonia, Czech Republic, Greece, Turkey and Argentina. But the country offering publicly funded education without fees that I came up on most web searches that really surprised me was Ireland. At €3,000, Ireland has the eighth highest fees in the world, second highest in the EU, and after Brexit will have the highest third level fees in the European Union. And yet we still advertise as having free fees, free education. We have a grant scheme, has been mentioned, that covers this for 46% of students. But who are that other 54%? There are students who refuse a grant because their parents had just gone over the low threshold in the grant scheme. There are the students who refuse the grants because they worked just too many hours in their part-time job last year. There are the students who refuse a grant because of their parents' income without any consideration of whether they will receive support from their parents. There are the students who refuse a grant because they did not have a utility bill in their name. There are the students who have become estranged or independent from their parents but are still refused because they're under 23 years of age. Since 2008, we've seen a 375% increase in the student contribution. And what have we gotten in return? Falling university rankings, the majority of institutes of technology in financial difficulty, 
Staff and students who are teaching who are overpaid or underpaid and overworked, and facilities that are not fit for purpose. As a percentage of GDP, Ireland invests the second least in education in the OECD. 1.2% of GDP in higher education compared to the 1.6% of the OECD average. To suggest that the only way to fix this is with an income contingent loan is dangerous. A student loan scheme would cost this country 10 billion over the next 12 years. It's estimated it would take at least 17 years for it to become self-financing and we'd lose 13 million a year in debt written off from graduates who have emigrated. But we have no idea what the cost of lo losing our most talented and highly educated young people will be. An Oireachtas Library report from last November suggests that international evidence suggests that the ultimate success of an ICL is linked to the level of default in the system. Of particular relevance is the means by which repayments should be collected from immigrant graduates. Two thirds of those immigrating from Ireland are graduates. The OECD estimates that Australia has a 3% of, of high skilled immigrant, immigration rate. The UK is 11% and Ireland is 21%. It's likely that Ireland will have a much higher cost at writing off debt from immigrants. immigrants. What will be the economic cost of our young people further delaying life milestones? In New Zealand, student loans have directly caused um, students being, and graduates being rejected mortgages and has led to a huge increase in the number of people in their late 20s and early 30s living at home. A student loan scheme will mean the student contribution raising to a minimum of four or five thousand euro. And I say minimum because in every country that has implemented this scheme, a considerable rise in fees has followed. In the UK in 1998, loan schemes were implemented at £1,000 per year. Since then, that has increased to £9,250 per year and has also resulted in maintenance grants being turned into loans for the most vulnerable. They also have seen a 40% decline in part-time mature students. Australia have a considerably lower number of students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds attending third level than in Ireland. The HEA National Access Plan committed to promoting access from underrepresented groups and all evidence shows loan schemes will work against this. A student loan scheme will mean that if you have 20,000 euro, that's how much you'll pay for your education. If you don't have 20,000 euro, you'll pay a lot more. It means that those who do not do the best financially with their degrees will pay less than those who do not. Mature students do not have an equal access to the labour market. Students with disabilities do not have an equal access to the labour market. Students who are loan parents do not have an equal access to the labour market. And we still have a gender pay gap that sees women earn 12% less than men. An income contingent loan will mean that mature students, students with disabilities, loan parents and women will pay the most for their education and the wealthy will pay the least. We are a generation that has already taken on one lifetime of debt and we're not taking another one. Higher education is a public good and should be treated as an investment rather than a cost. For every euro invested in higher education, there is a return of investment for four euros to the economy. There are significant social dividends coming from investing in higher education in terms of strengthening democracy, improving social inclusion and political stability, reducing crime rates and enhancing public welfare. But free education has always been resisted in Ireland. When the idea of free second level education was being debated in the 60s, transition from primary to second level was at 16%. Yet this is what came from the report from the Council of Education. An unqualified scheme of secondary education for all would be both financially impractical and educationally unsound. Only a minority would be capable of benefiting from such an education and standards would fall. Fifty years later, we were being told the same story. In budget 2011 and 2012, the student grant was cut significantly through payments, thresholds and adjacency rates. Since then, we've seen a drastic increase in the cost of going to college, especially the cost of student accommodation, which is spiralling out of control. We have heard countless students travelling long distances and missing lectures to be able to take public transport home. We have heard hundreds of students sleeping in overcrowded accommodation, staying in hostels and sleeping on floors. We heard from a student in Cork who would stay in college until the building closed, would sleep under a bridge until it reopened in the morning. And we are sick of hearing these stories. We are sick of seeing students homeless and living in poverty. Earlier today, we launched a position paper, which is down at the back of the room, on the future funding of higher education alongside the Coalition for Publicly Funded Higher Education. The Coalition is made up of the Union of Students in Ireland, the Irish Second Level Students' Union, the uh, Teachers' Union of Ireland, the Irish Federation of University Teachers, Forza Trade Union and SIP2. The six unions involved in this coalition represent students at second level and third level, academic staff, professional management and support staff, and are united in the belief that not only is public funded higher education desirable, 
it's achievable if the political will is there. A change in thinking and approach is required, away from viewing higher education as a mere line of spending to that of public investment, which yields a guaranteed long-term return. This is necessary if we were to properly recognise the importance of higher education as a social good that enhances the civic and social life of this state. Thank you.